Magic Celebration, September 8, 2012. Plan a no-charge Mini Master event while supplies last. Compliments of Wizards of the Coast. Find a location near you at locator.wizards.com. Let's do the time warp again. God, karaoke everywhere you look in Seattle this week, let me tell you. Zach, it's back to the old days, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2006. All Japan, all the time. Player of the year, player of the year. Yasuoka 06, Watanabe 09. In 2012, one of these two will be a repeat player of the year. But what the viewers and I want to know is which one. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think that uh, Yasuoka, he's been on a tear. I mean, he started out the, the non-elimination rounds 11-1 one last match in very, very clean fashion. I think he's got an advantage. Uh, his control deck against a mid-range deck, just so much card advantage, counter spells, very powerful. I think we're going to look at him to win this thing. He has displayed eternal command throughout the formats, throughout three days. Now he has to exhibit all of that skill and steel one last time against the Cascade Menace of Jund mm -hmm. and the master Yuya Watanabe. It's time for the first ever final of the Players' Championship. You cannot help but be filled with admiration for those 16 yeah. players who are the best of the best. They've given us an amazing championship. And now it's finals time. On the left, Shoti Yasuoka. On the right, Yuya Watanabe. Game one, it is showtime here. Let's rock and roll. Rich Hagen and Zach Hill in the booth with you as we see Zach and Inquisition of Kozilek to get the final started. Uh, when, I, when I saw the lands plus the cryptic command, I was like, is this Inquisition going to miss? But no, it turns out it's not. You've got Tarmogoyf, you've got Snapcaster Mage. Nothing really for the Snapcaster Mage to hit. I think you pretty clearly take the Tarmogoyf right here, unless you're playing for a really, really long game. Which you're really, really not, because Shouty Yasuoka has shown that he loves the game to go long. Three land, Tarmogoyf, Snapcaster, and Cryptic Command is his hand. On the right, Yuya Watanabe pouring over his choices, uh, and he is busy trying to gear up for Jund. He's going to want to cascade his Blood Braid Elf. He's going to want to kill everything that moves, gain some advantage with those cascade spells, disrupt as much as possible. Have to say, though, that that has been very, very tricky against a master of constructed magic who discovered this week, when it really counted, how to make limited work for him. Right, and that can't be underestimated. I mean, Yasuoka fresh off a limited GP top eight. I think he was sick and tired of, uh, you know, going X and one in the constructed rounds only to totally bomb out a limited portion. But uh, today we've seen him, uh, you know, three o two different limited pods. So uh, I think he's really improved, or uh, he's really improved his limited game. Really turn. awkward hand. <laughs> Look at that turn one Ethervar. That's the big moment already for Yasuoka. That's the signature card. Right. That's uh, turn two, of course. Right. Yeah, but turn, uh, turn two, turn two Ether Vials. So not right on time. Uh, he lost some of his creatures. Now, a really awkward hand from Watanabe right now. We see a Thought Seize and uh, another Inquisition. So he's going to strip the Cryptic Command for sure. Maybe the Snapcaster. I mean, it just possibly says, okay, well, I want to play a Treetop Village and uh, wait for him to draw a better Inquisition target. But. The double lightning bolt maelstrom pulse from Watanabe, not all that exciting. Yeah. Very little pressure he can put on the board right now. Yeah, I mean, things can change very quickly with Jun because you do, obviously, when Blood Braid occurs, whatever else happens, it's not just a 3 2 body that wasn't there before. It has haste, it piles in. Um, so, certainly, a, a turn that involves a Blood Braid can be pr pretty pressurizing. But you're absolutely right, Zach. It is not 
uh, the, the big pressure start from Watanabe. Inquisition number two takes out Snapcaster Mage. So uh, now we know that there are a couple of land and cryptic command in Yasuoka's hand. And Yasuoka will sacrifice his Misty Rainforest. And uh, that'll turn into a steam vents uh, from the original Ravnica block. And of course, we are just round the corner from a set that you were very much involved in. Return to Ravnica. Have to see uh, whether there are yeah, any exciting goodies in the land department there. We'll wait and see. Got the big PAX party tomorrow night. Maybe there'll be some unveilings of some interesting cards. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. We'll be right here to bring that to you. So, Yasuoka. It's the uh, Copper Line Gorge as his third land so that it doesn't come into play. Tap draws Spell Snare for the turn. You know, last turn I thought uh, Watanabe was going to cast Thoughtseize for Cryptic Command. Turns out to do the opposite. Cast Inquisition for the Snapcaster Mage. Mm. Now Thoughtseize coming out there. Uh, needed, you know, another look at a pr uh, maybe a juicier target. Well, so Spell Snare and Cryptic Command and land is what he sees. Uh, this is really interesting because uh, Cryptic way more powerful than Spell Snare, but he just drew Tarmogoyf. So uh, mm. he might just want to force that card through. Very difficult decision right now for Watanabe. Yeah, and we've certainly found that he thinks very carefully about these. Uh, cryptic Command, in fact, is what goes away. So, uh, I mean, m maybe he does he sort of run out the Tarmogoyf and say, I will leave you with literally nothing? Nope, that's not his plan. So uh, Ethervar goes up to two. And stomping ground and pass. Crack the land. Well, Watanabe's in really, really good shape right now to draw any three or four mana threat. Uh, a Dark Confidant or a Tarmowave even works for now because one draws a spell snare and the other one resolves. So Watanabe, if he can draw a threat, Yasuoka, very much, no way to contend with that after his hand was stripped by those discard spells. Barring that, I, we might expect a Maelstrom Pulse on the Ether Vial. Uh, it's really tough to say, uh, or just a simple attack by the treetop village. You know, Yasuoka at 19, Watanabe can start getting some damage on the board. Yeah, what is interesting, if you see at the bottom left of your screen, you see uh, Shota Yasuoka's graveyard. You see a Tarmogoyf, you see a Snapcaster Mage, you see a Cryptic Command. There is Maelstrom Pulse, but it's worth remembering that that graveyard is very much live within the Yasuoka game plan. And so you see those spells and you think, yep, yep, you could leave him down to nothing. And then he just draws an Eternal Witness, and off we go to the races. That Maelstrom Pulse is going to get mana leaked. So, Aether Vial still in play with two counters on it. Just one card in hand. The Aswoka, he ticks it up to three. And three with Cryptic Command on the graveyard is the magic combination. You know, he draws Eternal Witness that can immediately become a command at instant speed. Not enough mana to uh, cast Cryptic Command right now. He has four, but he doesn't have triple blue. Big mana leak off the top for the Maelstrom Pulse means the Aether Vial will do its work. But uh, this is exactly why it's so important, Rich, that Watanabe gets some pressure on the board. You're yeah. seeing that from the Treetop Village. All it needs, uh, all Yasuoka needs is a single Eternal Witness or a single Snapcaster Mage, and that entire graveyard becomes live again. Yep, so three from the Treetop Village. And it gets in. And there we go. Eternal Witness. And it's just like a whole parade of cards suddenly become visible. One of which is Tarmogoyf uh, that is going to come back. Uh, what now be just uh, gives a little uh, acknowledgement with his right hand, and uh, then Eternal Witness will come in. Oh look, Yasuoka the beatdown. How did right. that occur? <laughs> well, that's one of the unique elements of Yasuoka's deck is just how quickly it can change roles. We saw that happen when he was Eternal Witnessing back Snapcaster Mages. Now can witness back Tarmogoyf's two bolts from Watanabe capable of taking out Tarmogoyf. Not something you're too excited about. We see him draw a second Tarmogoyf to get around Watanabe's spell snare. Yep. That's exactly Look. what happens and he just passes the turn. See, and uh, on the one hand, that sort of advantage what an RB. Yes, I, you know, got rid of one of your counters, and I still got a Tarmogoyf at the end. But you look at the board, there's an Aether Vial at three, there's an Eternal Witness. The Tarmogoyfs will just stare looking prettily at each other. Um, and uh, Yasuoka's buying all the time in the world. It's 15 apiece uh, at life. It's nil-nil. 
a huge advantage right now to Yasuo. Right, I mean, I I Watanabe, it's pretty big if he can draw, terminate, and start attacking with that Tarmogoy mm. plus that treetop village. Yep. But I think just a lot more live draws in Yasuoka's deck. A little bit more library manipulation, too. He's got Thirst for Knowledge, he's got Serum Visions in addition to all of his recursion. Watanabe really wants a removal spell right now, particularly one he can hit off a of Blood Braid Elf. And Yasuoka, just any way to manipulate his deck and, and accumulate more card advantage, uh, get back some more cryptic commands. So, Yasuoka will just pass the turn. He does not see his one card, so that just sits on the table. Watanabe paused briefly to consider lightning bolting an eternal witness, I mm. think, at the end of the turn, but I uh, elected not to do that. Is it possible that Watanabe is planning on sort of saving up a ton of burn to unleash in a kind of end, end step? two spells untapped two more no it's just going to be uh, i'll take out the eternal witness here okay and uh throwing the other lightning bolt at tarmogoyf really uh, uh, about the best use he could possibly get out of those lightning bolts yeah. that was a big turn there <laughs> oh but <laughs> okay board's clear and, that, and now the block from Yasuoka starts to make sense. He's like, okay, well, great. I have a lightning bolt of my own, and uh, we're, we're kind of back to uh, stage zero right now. As, uh, Tree top beat them. Right, right, exactly. And with Yasuoka at a relatively healthy 15, that treetop village is not going to end the game anytime soon. Yeah, that's one of those things where we're going to look at each other when Shota's at six from three hits of treetop village. And remember when two minutes ago we said it wouldn't, yeah, it could be one of those, but we'll see. Mm. Uh, he's down to 12, uh, so that's four turns left uh, on the treetop village plan. Uh, Watanabe will just lay another land. Yasuoka will draw, um, lays a land, so he's still got just that one hole card. Uh, Watanabe draws, I think that was a land one. Uh, I think so it was a lightning bolt. Okay, activate treetop village. Well, that obviously shortens things by a turn if it was indeed a lightning bolt. As uh, the treetop village comes in, Yasuoka down to nine. And he's had a couple of relatively unexciting draws, but now here we go. Snap cast a mage, bring out the lightning bolt. That kills the treetop village before it stops being a 3 3 at the end of turn. And now we are absolutely uh, out of threats for Wadanabi, so Yasuoka will go back into uh, attack mode. Right, really kind of challenging to determine who's at advantage right here. You know, Yasuoka at nine. He has a Snapcaster Mage, that's a little bit of a threat, but uh, not really uh, too many ways to deal with anything Watanabe does. Watanabe, though, just land after land after land. Mm. And Snapcaster gets taken out by Lightning Bolt. Still that one card sits in hand for Yasuoka. He hasn't even picked it up for two or three turns now. It's just sitting there uh, behind his land. Watanabe uh, now lays another land. That'll be just a regular forest. Now, something we didn't see in Watanabe's matchup against the Zoo deck, but that is one of the reasons Jund is so powerful, are those creature lands. You know, between the sack lands that have gotten out the Ravnica duels this game and, and the lands that Watanabe has in the battlefield, a, a huge percentage of his lands are actually live draws. The deck very powerful in top deck mode, as we see with this Kitchen Finx mm. right here. There we go. So, what do you yep, past the turn. And this is the first time today, certainly, that we've seen Yasuoka kind of drawing pretty clunkily and not really seeing what he wants. He's got a huge graveyard, but he's just picking up cards and uh, now, ah, fake <laughs> snag for, for Finx. Oh. <laughs> kind of awkward to cast yeah. on specifically Kitchen Finx. Yeah. Mm. All right, but I'll lose one and gain two. Sure, but again, as we've sort of seen, Yasuoka doesn't actually care really what life his opponent's at. He just cares about his own until the point at which he assumes control and then goes on and wins. So uh, not a big deal to say you can have the Kitchen Finks back, back gain some more life. For sure. Uh, the mana leak in Yasuoka's hand, pretty awkward right now, but uh, fortunately he can throw it away with the Thirst for Knowledge. Three pretty important top decks here for Yasuoka as he tries to get something going this There's game. There's another Thirst for Knowledge, a mana leak, and a land were the three cards uh, that he found there. So now he's got some choices to make. He gets rid of land, mana leak, yep. keeping Vendillion, click what? land, Thirst for Knowledge. Mm -hmm. The click can come into play again for zero mana with the Aether Vial. Hmm. So here comes Kitchen Finks. Yasuoka picks up his hand, which again is in some ways a little tell that there's some action going on because it's been sitting just on the battlefield doing nothing uh, for a while. So Yasuoka obviously has choices. Watanabe knows that. And this is the result of that choice. And it's going to be Thirst for Knowledge. 
So three more cards, digging deeper. That looks like a spell snare, another ether vial, and a lightning bolt. Oh. So uh, he gets to get rid of an artifact. Now here comes Vendillion. Click off the virtual mana of ether vial. I think you have to just allow him to keep that Maelstrom Pulse right now. The worst thing in the world for you if you're Asioka is for Watanabe to draw a threat. Uh, the answer you don't care too much about. You can block the Finks, give yourself three turns. That's exactly what happens. It's tempting to think of this uh, as a game where both players have land flooded, but it's worth remembering that the graveyards are very full of relevant Somewhere. spells that have been cast in order to get us to this fairly attritional game state. It isn't just lots and lots of land on both sides. There's a ton of spells that have gone to the graveyard on both sides, lots of lightning bolts floating around in the early game to bring us to this stage. That's exactly right, and that's how these games are going to pan out. You know, just really a lot of uh, a lot of ways to negate one another's threats, and uh, you know, kind of both decks are designed for the semi-late game. John, a little bit faster than Yasuoka's deck, uh, but again, you don't play six creature lands in your deck if you're planning for every single game to end immediately. Yeah. So Finks with the persist counter on. That Ether Vial has been stuck at three forever, which right. is fine. And the four drops in Yasuoka's deck come out of the sideboard. Huntmaster, the Frozen, right. Glenelander, Archmage. So that Aether Vial very likely to stay at three for as long as this game goes on. Yeah, the Archmage is a card that we certainly may see. The Archmage. Mm. Yeah. All right, and then the Finks eats a lightning bolt. Uh, Yasuoka really needing to protect his six life as much as he can right now. You see Watanabe fanning out his graveyard, kind of just like, wow, I've, I've gone through all this. Look how much I've used. Yeah. Yeah, so Oka passes the turn. It's always uh, tempting to try and decipher each player's body language in matches like this. You know, there's these minor hesitations that mm -hmm. happen or, you know, uh, looking at different zones. You always want to, as a player, try and get information out of that. But sometimes it's just as likely you're going to just outthink yourself. So uh, yeah. kind of funny to watch. I saw Yasuoka take a little bit of a pause as he drew a card yeah. there. Couldn't see what it was. I, I'm wondering what that means. I think relatively that's th the mind game aspect is something that Japanese players as a whole tend to concern themselves with less than maybe some of the North American players. Um, I'm thinking at the highest level. I think that tends to be the case. And, and yeah, I, wow, no, a huge <laughs> blood braid elf here from Watanabe. Watanabe held the Inquisition of Kozilek last turn until he drew a threat, knowing that mana was not likely to be a limiting factor. Very likely to cast that Inquisition right now, see if the coast is clear, and try to resolve this yeah. very huge blood braid elf right yep, here. Yep, absolutely, and it is gonna resolve, and we see two lands, we see a lightning bolt and we see a spell snare. The lightning bolt will go away, so that of course will not be able to counter, uh, effectively counter the blood braid by killing it. Here we go, Liliana wow. of the Veil comes down, courtesy of blood braid. The blood braid will attack. Half of Yasuoka's life total is gone. And in one turn, Watanabe is going to be very close to a one nil lead. Now, Yasuoka did draw Vendillion Click here, so a draw step Vendillion Click, or it doesn't want to draw step because he knows about Maelstrom Pulse. Uh, the Dark Confidant Watanabe drew likely to get hit by a spell snare from Yasuoka. Uh, Yasuoka needs to cast Vendillion Click with Flash or use Ether Vial to put it into play or into draw step so that it doesn't get hit with Maelstrom Pulse. Yasuoka electing not to put it into play with Ether Vial so as not to draw another Maelstrom Pulse. Combat phase Vendillion Click from Yasuoka right here. And the question is, who does he target? Yeah. Well, he's sitting there with his two cards in hand. Let's see. The Spell Snare has not done a lot this game, but <laughs> Watanabe has a Dark Confidant in hand at 14 life points, could really take the game away. So uh, the, who, the, the target of this click could really decide the outcome of this match. And he targets himself, putting Spell Snare away. Okay, yep, so uh, <laughs> eventually, and then Dark Confidant, Liliana of the Veil, discard. Liliana's up to five. Yasuoka draws. Passes. He's at three. <laughs> Reveal her wow. blood braid elf. And that is going to be the game. Here we right go. Here. What an Arby. Looks it up. 
four. Yes, that resolves. <laughs> and electing not to cast, of course, yeah, the second exactly. Liliana of the Veil. Let's not do that. That would be poor. So it's going to be discard in, and that's game. <laughs> so the game went long, but Yasuoka didn't win it. Game on, boys. It's 1-0 to Yuya Watanabe. <laughs> Looking to face a greater challenge? Take your game to a Grand Prix and see how you fare against the best players in your region, as well as top visiting Magic Pros. Upcoming Grand Prix include Costa Rica, Moscow, San Jose, California, and Philadelphia. For more information, visit wizards.com forward slash Grand Prix. Well, Zach Hill, that is a surprise. That's the first time we've seen Yasuoka's deck kind of malfunction, if you like. And we've seen that, uh, yes, the game went long. He got an Aethervile going. He had stuff in the graveyard. But in the end, it was the card advantage engine, if you will, of Blood Braid Elf that, that did it for <laughs> Yuya Watanabe, 1-0. And, and that's exactly what happened. You saw Watanabe's discard strip a lot of Yasuoko's, both early pressure and card advantage in the form of Snapcaster Mage. That meant that Yasuoko's deck never really got off the ground. It had some thirst for knowledge as late, but a Vapor Snag, he was sort of down a card, didn't accomplish a lot. So you see the sideboards uh, coming up there. We begin with Shadi Yasuoka. Uh, again, you see the Ancient Grudges there. Um, You've got three Huntmaster of the Fells, a couple of Combust, uh, a Graf Digger's Cage there, uh, two Glenelendra Archmage, two Threads of Disloyalty, and two Spell Pierce. So, uh, Zach, any sense of what might be going on here? On the play, I think you want the Spell Pierce because the discard from the Jun deck is so devastating, as is an early Liliana of the Veil. Vale. On the draw, not so much. Uh, you don't get in under Inquisition and Thoughtseize. I think you absolutely want Archmage. Uh, the Persist is good for the card advantage as well as just all the removal from the Jun deck. Huntmaster of the, Fails, uh, the Fells is in many ways perfect for this matchup, sort of to uh, serve as, as your own copies of Bloodbraid Elf in a sense. And I have to think against a deck with both Tarn and Dark Confidant that Threads of Disloyalty just has so many quality targets that it would be hard to pass up. I must be honest, I would love to know as a card designer what Huntmaster of the Fails would look like. <laughs> Huntmaster that of would, the Fails. That would be an awesome card. I it, it transforms and there's just a regular magic pack <laughs> on the other side. I was going to say the line of text, if card name would transform, instead it doesn't. Instead it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think you want to give players the opportunity to take it out of the sleeve and turn it over <laughs> to find it, it's a regular magic card back. Or maybe an alliances card back. Or something. <laughs> that, that would do it. All right, let's move on. Enough of this tomfoolery. To you, your Watanabe, there's his sideboard. A Thoughtseize, a Jun Charm, a Batter Skull did great work in the semis. Two Graf Digger's Cage, two Seal of Primordium, two Ancient Grudge, two Pyroclasm, two Obstinate Badoff, and then a single Nile Spellbomb and Olivia Voldaren. I think you definitely want the, uh, the Thoughtseize for sure. The hand destruction proved key in that first game. Jun Charm, a card that can can stop the Eternal Witnesses and Snapcaster Mages from Yasuoka, while also you know helping you win a Tarmogoy fight or clearing some of those two ones off the board. Mm -hmm. Not sure if it's good enough to bring in, but uh, it, it's certainly an option. Graf Digger's Cage, too, not something that traditionally would, would fill this type of role, but uh, can again stop the Snapcaster Mages. You mm -hmm. probably want, I would guess, Jun Charm, Nihil Spellbomb, but not Graf Digger's Cage. Okay, now what about the Artifact Destruction for Aether Vials? Are we going to see Seal of Primordium? Are we going to see Ancient Grudge? I think Seal of Primordium makes some amount of sense because you can expect the Threads of Disloyalty out of Yasuoka's deck. Sure. On the other hand, you're already main decking Maelstrom Pulse and you could afford to lean on that card. Really challenging sideboarding from Watanabe right here. We see him looking at the Terminate, mm. trying to decide what's what's going to come out. Uh, a lot of really hard decisions because Yasuoka's deck operates on a lot of different levels. Mm. And that certainly does seem to be the problem. You see Yuyu Watanabe uh, sitting in, well, I wouldn't say a comfortable 1-0 lead, but certainly a 1-0 lead. Uh, and he now needs two out of the next four. Remember, it is best of five. If you're just joining us for the final, welcome. We're sorry that uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, hope you were, what, maybe some of you were at work. We know we got lots of people saying they were sneaking out to have a look at their phones to see what was going on and watching during lunch breaks. And uh, someone on Cover It Live earlier on, Faith, I think it was, said, uh, I'm really glad this airport has free Wi-Fi. 
really enjoying the show. Uh, so uh, uh, get home safe wherever you're traveling to, Faith. Uh, and thanks for joining us on Cover It Live, uh, all our fans out there. So we're gearing up for game two. Yasuoka on the left, Watanabe on the right. Watanabe, it seems like, side out, sided out one of his kitchen things, supposedly uh, probably playing around Remand and Mana League. Still, if kitchen things does hit the board, it's a little bit problematic for Yasuoka. Unlike what we saw against the Zoo deck when kitchen things is a 2-1, really didn't trade with much, really didn't accomplish much, the 2-1 version of kitchen things still blocks with and trades with and kills all of Yasuoka's creatures. So interesting choice to side out, but you don't want to make yourself vulnerable to all of the two mana counter magic. Yeah, it's so interesting. You, you, it's a sort of glass half full, glass half empty thing where you look at the, the different aspects of Yasuoka's deck and you see cards that do genuinely put a, a crimp in the plans. When you see those big graveyards and you think, yep, actually getting rid of a graveyard here would be a really big deal. And then you go, yeah, there's this ether vial, and look at all these artifact destruction, and getting rid of that ether vial would be a really big deal. And then you say, well, all these little guys with one toughness, all those pyroclasm effects, really big deal. But you can't do all of them, and that's the great strength of the Yasuoka deck. That's true. Now, Watanabe looks at his hand. Uh, pretty good hand, double dark confidant, uh, Tarmogoyf, but only contains one black cleave cliff, so he has to send it back. Yasuoka looking uh, a little bit more comfortable with uh, Bolt, Huntmaster, the Fells, and I believe Vapor Snag to go along with four lands, or is that something else? Can't quite see at the moment. We don't, uh, we don't yet have that on our monitor. Maybe it's a thirst for knowledge. Ah, uh, nah, who knows. I should get a better eyeglass prescription. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. At any rate, uh, Watanabe mulliganing down to six. It's hard to decide what kind of uh, hand you want to draw in this matchup. Your two mana cards like Dark Confidant, ordinarily very powerful, but can come back to bite you with, uh, th with uh, threads of disloyalty on, from Yasuoka's side. On the other hand, Liliana the Veil can do a lot of work right here, but it can get hit with counter spells. Uh, a lot of uh, particular interactions in this matchup that can really decide the, the entire pace of the game. Looking at Cover It Live, currently, uh, who will win the Players' Championship? 82% uh, had Shota Yasuoka, 18% Yuya Watanabe. Uh, I'd be interested to see how that changes in light of uh, the 1-0 lead for Yuya. Uh, a reminder that uh, at the start of this, around about 4% went with Watanabe, but we're underway, Goofy. and it's now up to Shota Yasuoka to equalize at 1-1 if he can. A much better hand from Watanabe has Dark Confidant plus a Seal of Primordium to deal with threads if that's in fact Yasuoka's line. Yasuoka now fetching out a Steam Vents and uh, looks like pretty reasonable draws from both sides. We're probably going to get to see a real game of Magic right now. Okay. So Yasuoka gets ready for his turn two. Last game, it was an Ether Vial on turn two. This time, it's a land and go. And that looks like a Vendillion click is the card we weren't able to determine earlier from Yasuoka's side. So that's going to come out on turn three. We expect a Dark Confidant from Watanabe. That's exactly what happens. And it immediately <laughs> gets Lightning Bolt. There is no world in which you gener generate card advantage from that guy, <laughs> if I can help it, says uh, Yasuoka. And he's going to click Watanabe. And we get to see six cards. We get to see a Kitchen Finks at the top, then a Dark Confidant. Then it's Blood Braid Elf. Jun Charm is next. We do see Seal of Primordium and a land. So that's the six. And now uh, Yasuoka has to decide whether he cares enough about any of those to make them go away. Um, having instantly killed with, with extreme prejudice, as I believe you folks tend to say over here, uh, the Dark Confident, does Can he consider taking, uh, getting rid of something there? What, what goes away? I think he took well, Blood Braid Elf yeah. there. Uh, uh, is that what happened? Oh, no, it was nope. Jun Charm. Mm. Jun Charm making sense because of Huntmaster of the Fells. Wat uh, excuse me, Yasaoka with a 3-1 Vendillion click this turn. Between that and Huntmaster, I think he expects to go on the aggressive. Does not want Jun Charm to completely wipe his board, so he puts away the Jun Charm. Watanabe now on three. Some very interesting choices to make. Right. I think he's going to cast Kitchen Finks here, trying to establish a board presence of his own. But that Huntmaster of the Fells from Yasuoka's side, very, very uh, dominant right now. Yeah. 
even if Watanabe does resolve the Bloodbraid Elf, that simply trades with a Huntmaster token. Sure, mm. can you do the thing? So. And that's exactly Here what we, we do see, the Kitchen Fangs. Yep, so Watanabe. Sure. Gains a little bit of bonus life. It's back to 19 apiece here in game two of the final. Now it does gain two life off the kitchen things, but takes two life from the stopping ground. So not the ideal situation, but uh, it's what you have to do. I think uh, being able to race Yasa Oka's three points in the air with three points on the ground from things, very important for Watanabe right here as he can maintain his momentum. Mr. Ra Misty Rainforest goes away for land number four and Expecting Yasuoka to head towards a, a fairly offensive uh, position here in this game. He has the 3 1 fly that uh, Yuya needs to deal with uh, directly. He doesn't have uh, flies floating about to uh, be an air force. So Yasuoka offers up his hand and then says, Here's for mana, and here is my best Brian Kibler impression. <laughs> it's Huntmaster of the Fells with accompanying rule. You know, if I had to sit and pick a, a card of the year, for Magic, uh, it might be Hunt Master of the Fells. Fair. We've seen it at Pro Tour uh, Dark Ascension. We've seen it at Pro Tour Avacyn Restored. Now we're seeing it here at the Players' Championship in Modern. I mean, Hunt Master of the Fells seeming to define almost every format it's legal in. Here comes Blood Braid Elf. It cascades into another Kitchen Finks. And maybe that changes the race. What a Nabi will go in. And this is very unlike game one, and it's unlike any game we've seen so far today in either semi-final. We're now seeing, well, there's creatures in play, and they're interacting in the red zone. Hmm. I think Watanabe, or uh, Yasuoka, wants to block Bloodbraid Elf right here. I, the plan's got to be to pass with that Huntmaster of the Fells. Yasuoka's deck operates almost entirely at instant speed, making it sure, much sure. less costly to flash Huntmaster than it would be in a variety of other decks. I think that's what we're about to Point see is the attack from the Dillion click uh, and then a pass. Yeah. So click comes in. It's now Ravager of the Fells. Damage goes to, to Watanabe. There's no artifact floating about to get a little bit of uh, kill that. So now it's the 4 4 Trampler sitting there. And dealing two, of course, to Kitchen Finks and two to Watanabe, which mitigates the Kitchen Finks coming back in mm -hmm. and persisting. The 4 4 Ravager big enough to block all of Watanabe's cards. Yasuoka content right now to attack in the air with the uh, Vendillion Click. He's got a Spell Snare ready for either the Seal of Primordium or the Dark Confidant. So uh, we now see exactly why Huntmaster of the Fells is in Yasuoka's sideboard. You talked about 10 being the magic number in terms of uh, Yasuoka being within reach of Paolo in the previous round. What is a number that Watanabe can be low enough that Shota would look at a Dark Confidant and think, you want to kill yourself with that, mate? It's a really good question. Uh, it depends on what stage in the game it is. Of course. And, uh, and how vulnerable is it? 17 life, I think at 8 or something, Yasuoka can say, okay, that can stick around, given that it's relatively trivial for him to go Lightning Bolt, Snapcaster, Lightning Bolt, or Bolt, okay. Eternal Witness, Bolt. So I'd put the number at around 8. Right. Right now, Watanabe has said, how about I have a Planeswalker? Liliana of the Veil, vale, and Shota says, how about you don't? Right, a cryptic command, just uh, Yasuoka wants to cast it whenever he can. Liliana, pretty big threat. Both the Vidillion Click and the, and the Ravager of the Fells, very important right now. I've got to expect counter draw come out of Yasuoka, but he does have a number of options right now. Got to feel that Patrick cool. Chapin, Chapin is enjoying watching this, seeing uh, so many cryptic mm -hmm. commands do their thing. Congratulations, of course, to the innovator, uh, going to be inducted into the Magic Hall of Fame. Pro Tour return to Ravnica in just a few short weeks here, again, in Seattle. All right, so uh, Mountain off the top for Yasuoka off the Cryptic sure Command, or, or, and then he drew okay. another Spell Snare. So the plan of just attack with Vendillion Click seems to be sure doing enough work easy. right now. So he is down to 11, and Yasuoka is indeed being the beatdown. Who knew that his deck could do that? It does everything. What if it makes the tea? <laughs> well, this just goes to show exactly how much your deck can transform after sideboarding. You know, a lot of the time, you just embed a completely different plan mm -hmm. into your deck post board. And Ravager really cleaning up Watanabe's whole board. Uh, it's kind of impossible for those kitchen things to get anything going right here. So, Watanabe draws. 
draws Thoughtseize. Now he knows, I think, about one of the spell snares. If he doesn't know positively about it, he can certainly expect one by now. But uh, two spell snares in Yasuoka's hand, meaning that Dark Confidant not likely to resolve anytime soon. Yeah, and he sees spell snare, spell snare forest, takes a snare, but not really getting ahead. Watanabe after that thought season, certainly falling behind two life points, mm. putting him within four attacks of Vendillion Click. Oh, yeah. three attacks, excuse me. So now in it comes, nine will go to six. And again, Watanabe had Dark Confident and didn't uh, didn't run it out because now maybe we are in range. Here's Eternal Witness, yeah. get back Cryptic Command. Zach Hill rocks back in his chair in the booth because that, just like that, is one, one. Whew. That was a good one. 1-1 one, one here I, I, at the Players' Championship. So just, uh, Zach, you, you, were, you had a visceral response to the end of that one. Well, a, a proper kind of, wow. Well, I know, it was unreal. The, uh, he had exactly seven mana for Eternal Witness in the Cryptic Command, almost exactly lethal. I mean, it was exactly what he needed to top deck from Yasuoka's side. Dag Faden is the greatest thief in the multiverse. Follow his adventures in the Magic the Gathering comic produced by IDW. A special promo card unique to the IDW comic series comes in each issue. Find out more about these comics at wizards.com forward slash magic merchandise can uh, tell you that uh, plenty of uh, chat on cover it live zach about uh, cards of the year people have asked uh, well what about snapcaster maybe that's certainly uh, a good one people have mentioned geist of st trapped uh, and of course delver of secrets uh, has been mentioned a number of times as well in uh, in that sort of uh, package if you like uh, all, all very viable cards. I'm just sitting here thinking about what we've seen uh, in this booth during the, the final days of Pro Tours. I mean, uh, Huntmaster has been all over the place and has taken down a couple of titles, but any of those cards make sense too. All right, let's uh, see Shota Yasuoka once again. There you see closing in on his 300 lifetime uh, pro points. Uh, interesting, uh, he got here as one of the top pro points at large, um, so uh, not as a title holder as such. Within the 16, um, in the top four for pro tours and matches, and also total matches overall. He's also been very busy on the Grand Prix circuit, uh, playing 61 Grand Prix for his 15 Grand Prix top eights. That 25% more or less, is an astonishing return at the Grand Prix level. He's 64% uh, overall. Um, and something you wanted to mention there, Zach. Well, I mean, just if, if you think about that, again, you look at these numbers, it's hard to appreciate what that means. 25% of the time making the top eight of a Grand Prix means that one out of every four times you show up to tournaments with over, like, around 1,500 people, and you're still, you know, one out of four times you're in the top eight of that field. I mean, how much better than the opposition do you have to be to have those kind of odds? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it is one of the, the starting numbers because when you come, for most of us, when we go to a GP, we're there for fun, we're there to win as many as we can. Maybe the better players have a hope of making day two and being one of the last 246 people who could still win the Grand Prix. These people turn up and they expect to be one of the last eight people to win the Grand Prix time after time after time. Let's take a look at you, Watanabe, who you see there deep in thought, getting ready for what is now a best two out of three showdown. Uh, let's see uh, his, and again, the Grand Prix records just startling. 16 top eights out of 57. His Grand Prix percent is 28. He's even higher than Shota Yasuoka. Um, and uh, his Grand Prix win uh, very high within this group. His top eight's uh, second in the group. Uh, and basically only Owen Turtonwild. He's the like number one for GP win percentage uh, in this field. But the six titles we've already talked about. And these two have gone at it a bunch. Of course, they've also played uh, in Japan. But we kind of focused on the big matches, the Pro Tours, the Grand Prix. It's 3-2. Uh, to Watanabe in terms of Pro Tours, 1-0 to Yasuoka at the Grand Prix level, and then in 2005 they played in Nationals when they were very, very young. Remember, Watanabe currently only 23, so back in 2005, a 16-year-old fresh-faced Yuya Watanabe claimed a victory uh, from Yasuoka. So 4-3 Watanabe at the moment, uh, not including this weekend. And here now we are down to the best of three 
for the Players' Championship and the 2011-2012 Player of the Year. Oh, are, are, are that an... He, he's sideboarding out th some number of those cryptic commands we talked about. I mean, I guess on the draw, it just really? takes a long time for mm. that to get going. So uh, it, it makes sense now why the, the pace of the game changed up. I think he's planning on using the Eternal Witnesses now to get back copies of threats rather than answers and uh, okay. focusing uh, you know, on just uh, developing his board presence rather than casting uh, Dismiss right. over and uh, over again. Uh, yeah, and I suppose part of the argument there is, is that, uh, yeah, um, Cryptic Commands uh, did, did go out um, before game two. I guess part of the thinking is Bloodbraid Elf, when it appears, does stuff just by appearing. So remands aren't super exciting against that. Bouncing with Cryptic Command isn't super exciting. Yes, you can tap it to effectively de-haste it, but it's still a creature. It's still giving you value with another uh, card coming down, potentially, unless you have to have a second Liliana of the Veil, which we saw in one of the earlier games. Um, so it uh, seems, seems like a pretty, uh, pretty fair uh, way to go about things. I mean, Cryptic Command, a signature card, but uh, doesn't want to get this stuck with many of them against uh, enter the battlefield effects. Well, yes, uh, you make a very good points with the ETB effects, especially with a uh, Bloodbraid Elf doesn't even need to enter the battlefield. It's when he cast it uh, as mm. well. Um, also, just Thought sees and uh, Liliana the Veil, on top of Inquisition of Kozilek like to strip other cards out of your hand, meaning means that against Jun, sitting there holding spells in your hand is a very vulnerable place to be. And so Cryptic Command is a spell that you really need to hold on to to get your value out of it. It's just sorting, sort of asking to be repped by Liliana as it ticks up turn after turn after turn. Okay, I don't often quote directly from Cover It Live, but Fel Batista, you are the winner uh, because you've come up with the card of the year is Sanctuary Cat by a large margin. How did I not realize that earlier? I just... <sighs> that man is a smart man. I despair, of you, I despair of you, Zach Hill. Sanctuary Cat is the most adorable magic card by a very, very, very wide margin. That's Patrol Hound. Love <laughs> Muffin. <laughs> what are you talking about? You were probably uh, 12 when they brought Oh, I've played many game. Patrol Hounds. That was my first Pro Tour, actually. It was, was right, it after uh, really? right after Odyssey so came out. So 2002, out. somewhere around about then? The Pro Tour New Orleans. I believe it may wow. have even been 2001. 2001, that makes sense. All right, so there you see Shota Yasuoka. He gives nothing away. Um, I was delighted to see. It's a, Genuinely, this is going to sound like I don't mean this, but I really do. I was delighted to see a photo of Shota Yasuoka relaxed and smiling because you don't often see that at Pro Tours. <laughs> and this, and this, genuinely, this environment here has lent itself to something we talked about in the semi final interviews that it's really casual, then the lights go on and it's utterly brutal. And then it goes back to being casual again. And we caught Shota in just a quiet moment and, and he was really enjoying himself. And that's great to see. So we're at 1 1, Raging Ravine from Watanabe, and turn one Ether Vial from Shota Yasuoka. That's what you want to see if you're a Yasuoka fan. Right, and, and we haven't really seen Ether Vial uh, do its thing much this match, uh, er, but now, you know, getting it on turn one doesn't have to wait. Going to start ticking up for those Eternal Witnesses, those Tarmogoyfs, those Hunt Masters of the Fells. Uh, Yasuoka has to be thrilled to have one of those. Now, awkwardly having to cast it off Copper Lion Gorge means that he might not get some of his blue mana off until later, but, uh, you know, as, as Watanabe sits there and thinks, uh, you've got to want to cast turn one vial every single game if you're on Was Yasuoka's side of the board. Mm. So, Watanabe pondering out his options here with a full seven cards. Eventually, he decides it's going to be Raging Ravine number two, and essentially skipping a turn in order to get that second Raging Ravine into play. Yasuoka will lay a second land untapped, and at that point he has the chance uh, chance to make a Tarmogoyf. Uh, he will not take it, uh, because uh, pretty soon that Aether Vial will tick upwards from one, and then Yasuoka will have the chance to do it for free. How about Kitchen Finks? Yeah, Kitchen Finks coming down from Watanabe. Watanabe opted not to cast Tarmogoyf last turn, even though he could get it through Spell Snare. Uh, it, no cards in the graveyard, which is not something you see a lot in modern, so uh, the Tarmogoyf would have bit the dust to a Lightning Bolt. 
Yasuoka now casting Lightning Bolt on Kitchen Finks, maybe just to get a threat into the graveyard for his mm -hmm. own, or a card into the graveyard for his own Tarmogoyf. Also possibly saying, okay, I don't have a Lightning Bolt in my hand to draw out the Tarmogoyf or Dark Confidant from Watanabe in order to hit it with the Threads of Disloyalty currently in his hand. Sure. Also, um, he's got Eternal Witness in hand. He has the possibility of uh, getting himself up, put the Ether Vard at three maybe at some point, and then go, okay, here's my Eternal Witness, get that Lightning Bolt, finish off the Finks. Um, that's another way round of doing it. Not sure that's the best way, but it's certainly a way. Well, and he does have Snapcaster Mage, too, with the Ether Vial out. So, I mean, he can flash back the Bolt if he wants to to deal with the Finks. He can drop a Tarmogoyf on the table, although that's awkward in concert with Snapcaster Mage. I feel like he probably wants to just play Mage, bolt the Finks, and start attacking, get some of those life points back. That's not what happens, though. Tarmogoyf. And untap. Thing is, we've got Treetop Village down now as well for Wadanabe. He's really assembling the creature lands over there. Double Raging Ravine and a Treetop Village. Uh, Wadanabe, uh, Yasuoka would just pass. Right, currently the 1-2 the, uh, the Tarmogoyf hanging back right now. Now, this is interesting because he's got a Huntmaster of the Fells in hand, uh, Yasuoka. Will he put Aether Vile to four uh, and send it that way? Or will he leave it at three, bearing in mind that he's got Eternal Witness in hand um, and is sort of starting to be in that range of just, here's an Eternal Witness, get something back. And I don't know. Does he go to four? We'll see. Uh, that looks like an Olivia Voldaren mm. in Watanabe's hand. Yep, that's just a one-of out of the sideboard. And probably not something you want to play when it's in lightning bolt range, but as we saw the, those board stalls where he has eight lands in play, <laughs> uh, Olivia can become very large very fast. Yes. Yeah, because every time she uh, deals the one damage, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on her, and then ultimately three black blacks steal a vampire, and since you've turned them into vampires, that means anything you've hit. All right, so we see a Twilight Mire come down for Watanabe, and uh, Raging Ravine okay. getting in the red zone. That's an interesting call. Now, uh, Yasuoka says, uh, hold on, I imagine there's going to be an effect uh, uh, using that lightning bolt before the trigger of the Raging Ravine resolves. Yeah, because right now it's waiting to become a 4-4 four, four attacker. But as it stands, it is still 3-3 three, three with a trigger, as Zach says, on the stack. Uh, so Yasuoka looking to uh, get something into play here. So it'll be Snapcaster Mage into lightning bolt take out the ravine and then when the uh, trigger attempts to resolve it goes so where's my oh no raging ravine that's exactly what happens interestingly needs to use the fetch land despite having four mana untapped because he has two flooded groves and he doesn't want to tap the copper line gorge in order to get the blue mana he needs for snapcaster mage from one of those flooded groves mm. no. so Ether Violet 3, there's a Threads of Disloyalty in hand, and that looks like Glenelendra Archmage that he's drawn out of the sideboard uh, with Persist, chance to counter non-creature spells, and then you Persist, bring it back, so functionally it works as two counter spells against a non-creature. And we see just a very different game plan uh, as the Archmage gets cast from Yasaoka post board. He's uh, basically just dropping threats onto the table and saying, okay, John, like, Feel free to compete with this. Uh, Treetop village in hand for Watanabe. Grip full of very powerful cards. Watanabe, I think, just going to try and develop his mana base right here. Uh, in, unless he, he decides to go for Olivia, uh, which looks like, uh, yeah, looks like that's what he's trying to do. You see, I heard you say grip full of powerful cards, and the last 17 times someone said that about an opponent of Shota Yasuoka, they got utterly butchered shortly <laughs> thereafter. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, but there is Olivia, uh, and we do see the Ether Vault tick up to four, which means that that Huntmaster of the Fells can be viled in. And like we talked about the interaction of viling and Huntmaster and immediately flipping it, but it looks like Yasuoka has no real plan for that Olivia. Mm. When Watanabe activated the Raging Ravine, I think he was just trying to draw out the bolt, knowing he had Olivia in hand, suspecting perhaps that Yasuoka went low on cryptic commands, and it looks like Olivia might just take this game over. Wow, let's see. Well, there's Huntmaster of the Fells, plus friend. So... Shota is back up to 19. So it's not like he's in any danger of dying right now, but 
Wow, that Olivia Voldaren's looking pretty, uh, mm. pretty exciting over there. And, Let's and see. With the Huntmaster triggers on the stack, he can just kill it. And that's exactly what happens. Olivia going up to a 5-5 now outside of Lightning Bolt range. There was a one-turn window for Yasaoka to top deck a bolt. That window has passed. And now Watanabe has got to be feeling pretty good going well, on the offensive with the Vampire. Well, Yasuoka presumably is looking for Vapor Stack. That is certainly a card. I don't even know if he left it in against yeah. a deck full of uh, Kitchen Finks, but it's possible he did uh, for exactly situations like this. He's drawn another Huntmaster of the Fells. I mean, surely he can't. He's sort of lining up a, a, a large team, but there's no way he can race here with New Year up at 24, plus all kinds of uh, creature lands. Going to flash in another Huntmaster. That is going to happen. So Shota goes above 20. Both players now above 20. And uh, I mean, yeah, it, it's. And we're it's we're, we're playing yeah, Huntmaster is there, but we're going to just see, I think, exactly what we saw last turn. Mm. And it sounds as if those two Vapor Snags, because we did say basically that Remand wasn't good putting things back in hand, Cryptic Command wasn't great putting things back in hand. For the same reason, Vapor Snag, not great putting things back. Sounds like those two Vapor Snags are in Yasuoka's board. Thanks to Rashad Miller, our eyes and ears on the floor yes. here in the final. Similarly, we see Nihil Spellbomb in Watanabe's deck right now. So we some of the sideboarding mysteries gradually getting solved, but uh -huh. Olivia just absolutely taking over this game right now. So, I mean, what what possible answers are there? There's, uh, there no, and that's not going to do it. Uh, there are two cryptic through. commands left, yeah. uh, with that which Shalta would need to find in a hurry. Find, find both, essentially. And you go bounce and then counter it when it comes back down. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean right, that's right. Yeah, there goes Huntmaster, and the counters keep on ticking on Olivia. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I wish you guys could see this inside the booth. Rich and I just looked at each other, storming through the deck, trying to figure out what answers to a 7-7, seven, seven, or sorry, 8-8 eight, eight Olivia Voldaren there are. Turns out there aren't too many of them, and uh, this game is, is going to yeah. go on for a little while now, but uh, Olivia has done some work, and uh, Yasuoka really needs to find something that I suspect may just not be there in order for his deck to get off the ground this game. Yeah, using all our skill and judgment, we decided that the one breeding pool uh, from Yasuoka wouldn't be enough <laughs> uh, to take down <laughs> Olivia Voldaren. But, uh, yeah. Because, I mean, we're going to see uh, Olivia get even one point bigger at the end of the turn. Eventually, it might just start uh, stealing, some, uh, stealing some vampires. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just fabulous. I, you know, I mean, I feel sorry for Shota if that is what's about to happen as we see Eternal Witness uh, appear. Um, and uh, Huntmaster of the Fells is going to come back and Huntmaster of the Fells is going to come down. I mean, sh sh 23 each. Shota still has plans. I mean, like, is his plan here just to... Can he possibly race an Olivia? I, just make, I mean, he's now up to one, two, three, four, five, six um, creatures in play. I feel like he wants to draw just like the he's literal magic card overrun. He's oh, God. right now. Yeah, <laughs> the actual honest to God overrun. Yeah, because he, he's got another Eternal Witness in hand. So uh, if Yuya kills Huntmaster again, yet again, Eternal Witness can bring Huntmaster back from the graveyard. Ether Vile can bring it in. Another wolf will occur. Right. Uh, the, the thing about this turn is that because Eternal Witness was cast, Huntmaster of the Fell's not in danger of flipping anytime no. soon. Mm hmm. But uh, Watanabe is still just trying to figure out what the best line is. Doesn't probably want to cast any of those two drops and render Yasuoka's Threads of Disloyalty live. He's thinking about whether he wants to play Bloodbraid Elf. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like you just want to start machine gunning even more creatures with Olivia. Start attacking eventually once you can deal with that Glenelindra Archmage. Uh, you know, the, the Bloodbraid Elf not really accomplishing a whole lot on the attack, but uh, you might just be trying to cascade into something useful here. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, a Maelstrom Pulse that says, how about Wolves? That seems pretty reasonable. Let's sure. see what happens. One, two, three, four, Bloodbraid Elf. Here comes the Cascade. It's a land. It's another Bloodbraid. It's a Kitchen Finks. You see, and now Watanabe's board again looks vastly more solid. Am I 
of managing things, for the last 10 minutes, have the life totals just gone up? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what's so challenging for Yasaoka right here, because, I mean, he's accruing a pretty large board presence by recurring those Huntmasters of the Fells, but he doesn't have lethal. He's not even close to having lethal. So, And now we see Olivia get on the offensive as those Kitchen Finks stall the ground, and mm -hmm. Yasaoka needs to find an answer in a hurry. Four mana up for Watanabe, representing a few points of Olivia damage as well. That uh, Glenalindra very likely to bite the dust yep, in the near comes future. Comes back with Persist. So uh, the one counter on there. And we go back to Shota Yasuoka, who draws a Seer of Visions, which he will pretty much immediately cast to see, um, just in case he's forgotten what's going on. Um, his deck draws and then looks at two. Uh, they were easily thrown away because I believe they were both land. Uh, and now the turn will continue with six creatures on the left and four creatures on the right. Olivia Voldaren, double Kitchen Finks, one with Persist, and Blood Braid Elf. That's the one on Albi board on the right of screen. On the left, Ether Violet 4, Tarmogoyf, a Persisted already Glenament Elendra Archmage, Huntmaster of the Fells, plus three wolves. And again, Shota still has plenty of good cards in hand, including Eternal Witness, Threads of Loyalty, and a Spell Snare. That is his three-card hand right now. So he can do the Eternal Witness Huntmaster trick again, uh, very likely for one of those Huntmasters to die at the end of this turn. But for just two mana, Watanabe can get rid of Yasuoko's only flying blocker and... Uh, that that is going to be a, a tremendous amount of damage from Olivia. That's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yasaoka readying his creatures for an attack, realizing that the writing's on the wall. He needs to put something together right here. So those six creatures are still those same six creatures, even though you've ordered them slightly differently. <laughs> I mean, they look very pretty that way. And now here we go, Sir Mer Ah Sir Her spell smash, and in it comes from. Yasuoka, and instantly Watanabe says, hey, how about we reorder the battlefield a tad, uh, and let's see what I want to do here. Uh, I've got Blood Braid Elf, I've got Double Kitchen Finks, one with Persist. Um, as long as I don't do anything catastrophically stupid, you're going to really struggle to beat me here, but let's make sure I don't do anything catastrophically stupid. Also might just be trying to get some creatures in the graveyard. If he, if the Glenelander Archmage dies, he can hard cast Eternal Witness and put it back into play with Aether Vial, which buys him a little bit more time for that uh, Olivia. Mm. Um, also just, yeah, like you said, just okay, well, sitting back playing defense is not gonna win me the game, so why not attack and see if I can get him to make some bad blocks? Yeah. So they uh, confirm uh, that uh, lots of carnage ensues and a few cards uh, by the dust. But at the end of all that, what a Nobby went from 23 to uh, 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Massive life point swing. In, indeed. You see. And uh, Watanabe still hasn't even used Olivia Voldaren at this point. So still even more counters can continue to grow onto her. You know, if, if you ask me which card I expected to see in the finals dominating the last round of Modern at the Players' Championship, I don't know that the first card that would have sprung to mind was Olivia Voldaren. Sanctuary Cat. Oh, if only there was Sanctuary Cat. That would make my life. So Q. here's Eternal Witness. Well, Nobby, of course, says, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Sure, yeah. You get back another Huntmaster. Might get back Serum Visions to try and dig for something. Might get back another Eternal Witness, even though those all die. I, I guess you just got to be on plan right now and get back Huntmaster of the Fells. And then yep. that's exactly what's going to happen. That's he can it. put it into play whenever he wants. I'd like to uh, finish off your Tarmogoyf from that extensive and expensive combat. I believe we are at 12 counters now uh, on Olivia. Right. Is that we're right? Uh, uh, no, no, no. It's less than that. Sorry, that was a one. So we're at eight counters on uh, Olivia now. Sorry to scare you, Yasuoka fans. <laughs> All right, right. Nearly an 11 11 Olivia Voldaren. Oh, as that's if that's not terrifying that, enough. Uh, that's just embarrassing, isn't it, really? Uh, 23 life points, Yasuoka's side. Dead in two attacks to the Olivia. <laughs> 
Uh, you're right. How many times can you say that? Oh, I'm at 23. What are you dead to? Two attacks from how many creatures? Uh, just one. Yeah. You know, uh, grip full of cards for Watanabe, but he's got to want to just, I, I think he just wants to attack with Olivia and just start machine gunning the board. All right, and attack with Olivia Voldaren. Oh. Yasuoka can put Huntmaster of the battle, uh, Huntmaster of the Fells onto the battlefield whenever he would like, but against all of Watanabe's untapped lands, there's only so much that can accomplish. Yasoka falling down to 12, so dead in the next attack to Olivia. No flying blocker, very likely to survive. Really needs to pick up a cryptic command on one of these next couple of draw steps. All right, we uh, just not a lot happening. Huntmaster of the Fells hitting the battlefield off the Aether Vial like we talked about. It can flip on Yasuoka's turn, so Yasuoka really kind of forcing Watanabe to kill it with Olivia. Still a lot of mana untapped uh, to, to yep. deal with any further threat that emerges. So while the recursion of Huntmaster keeps on happening, it's just not moving the game forward in any meaningful way. Yep, it turned out that when Olivia Voldaren came down, if you don't have a way to bounce and then counter, it's going to stay there and it's going to beat you. That seems to be what's happening here. Three wolves and Eternal Witness will attack. Watanabe will create, or will he? He was certainly about to turn on his treetop village. That is what now happens. He just had a moment's pause to think about that. That puts one in the way, puts Kitchen Finks in the way of another. And then uses the mana to get another counter. Now we're up to 11 counters on Olivia. 14 plays 18. The board is almost clear, but for a long time there's only been one non-land permanent that matters, and that has been Olivia Voldaren. And that is going to take Yuya Watanabe to within one game of a repeat Player of the Year title and your 2012 Players' Championship winner. Wow. Right, and now he untaps all of his lands. No blockers on Yasuoka's side. Nothing we've really seen. Tons of creature lands of Watanabe's if he wants to activate them. Probably doesn't need to. I think you just send with the Olivia here and say, all right, show me what you got. That's exactly what happens. There we go. It is 2-1 to Watanabe, and you can feel out there in the hall there aren't that many people out there because this isn't a 400-person Pro Tour or a 2,000-person GP Boston. But you can feel, like, what is going on here? Are the wheels coming off Yasuoka? It's not that. It's just, here's an Olivia. Turns out the sideboarding was really critical, that there weren't answers to a, a creature that was just going to get out of hand. And now, I think Yasuoka... Uh, as Watanabe, you see there on the right of your screen, he's going to take a little break. I think this is a big moment. It reminds me very much of watching Mario Pascoli um, up against John Finkel in the final of Pro, uh, Pro Tour Kuala Lumpur 2008, where Finkel, ahead, left the stage, and it was Pascoli left to kind of pull himself together and work out what he was going to do and try and sculpt a game plan. And Yasuoka, you see there, looking pretty lonely uh, on the left there. He's beaten pretty much everybody and pretty much handily only Alexander Hain from Canada in one round of modern has defeated Yasuoka to this point in the weekend uh, and so here well goodness gracious me what does he do here what cards does he bring in He's well you, you s yeah you, you saw him actually uh, he's, he thought about taking out a lightning bolt brought it back in brought out a spell snare for one of those cryptic commands we talked about the Magic Feather Case by Incipio lets your imagination flow. Keep your iPhone 4 or iPhone 4S protected from danger while showcasing Magic's awesome imagery, including the most popular planeswalkers and other amazing art. For more information, visit wizards.com forward slash magic merchandise. Yeah, Yasuoka in the last game. Uh Yasuoka in the last game, holding on to that threads of disloyalty until the very end. Spell snare and Threads, only good against Dark Confidant and Tarmogoyf. Very good against those cards, but doesn't always have them. So here we are back in the booth. A maximum of two games remain in this incredible week of magic. We've had the World Magic Cup just 10 days ago. We've had Grand Prix Boston last weekend, mm. where this finalist, Shota Yasuoka, made the top eight, demonstrating his limited chops. Came in here Wednesday, six rounds. 
Thursday, six rounds. Now, here we are, Friday evening, prime time here, six o'clock in the evening here in Seattle. Um, and we wanted to take a look at the 16, give you one more look at just some of their huge accomplishments. And in particular, it is so tough. One of the things that most people don't know is your average Pro Tour qualifier winner doesn't average 50% at a Pro Tour. They average significantly less than 50% because they get preyed upon by all the best players in the world. They prey upon each other. And of course, they don't always get to make day two and come back. So there are lots of people going two and five, and then that's the end of their time. So let's take a look at the Pro Tour match win percentage of our 16. And we begin bottom right. It's Reed Duke. Barely started uh, his Pro Tour career, so that number you can expect to rise significantly. But even so, he is at the coin flip 50%. Up we go. Next we have Su Ching Kuo. Round about 53, plays in lots of Pro Tour qualifiers. And of course, the uh, World Magic Cup champion with Chinese Taipei. Owen Turtonwald is next. He's closing in on 56% of his matches as we carry on up the right-hand column. Next up, we have Brian Kibler, 56.43. Part of that, when the players have played as long as someone like Kibler has, they've just played so many matches, it's extremely hard to keep the win percentage high. Samuel Estrati is next also at 56, the Pro Tour modern title from Philadelphia. David Ochoa, 57 and bits. On we go. As we continue up, Martin Uza up to into the 58s now. And to complete the first side of the column, we have Junior Ianaga. So we're heading towards 60%. Now, 60% is a huge deal if you can get all the way up there. Let's start our top eight of these. It's Josh Utterlayton from the United States at 59. At seventh, Shota Yasuoka. Here he is battling in the final, heading towards that magic 60% mark. Our top six. Do we crack it? We sure do. There's Yuya Watanabe exactly right on the money of a 60% win rate, which means our top five have got stellar records. Let's check them out. At five, once again from Japan, 61 and change, Shuhei Nakamura with his five Pro Tour top eights. No surprise. The top four, it's Johnny Magic, John Finkel, 61.1, virtually identical record to Shuhei Nakamura out of 64 Pro Tours for Finkel. Our top three, here we go. Number three, it's Alexander Haynes, 62.3. Now, of course, he's got a small sample. I hasn't played in many Pro Tours yet. So that is likely to come back into the pack, but a phenomenal uh, performance, obviously, on the back of his Pro Tour title earlier this year. And now the top two. Here we go. We have Paulo Vita Dama de Rosa of Brazil. That is nearly a 64% win rate. That is two out of every three matches, nearly. That just is incredible, given all the times that your deck misbehaves. They get the perfect draw. They have the great sideboard. You have the unwinnable matchup. That is just astonishing. It's basically you win everything that you can control. It's almost like that. And our number one player in this 16 for this player's championship, here he comes from the United States. It is Luis Scott Vargas at nearly 65%. And bear in mind that for all these players, all their draws, including intentional draws into top eights, well, that counts as part of their match record. So for them, we saw in their overall record, they, they have hundreds of draws uh, going over the years. And that means that they're, in a sense, it's artificially uh, deflated those figures because some of those matches they just didn't play. They went, let's go get a cup of tea. Well done. We'll see you in the top eight on Sunday. So that is your 16. The 16 players who provided you 12, 13, and now a 14th round of entertainment here at the Players' Championship. So we're at 2-1 to Yuya Watanabe. He will not have thought that he could get to this place because we talked, we did the headlines on Wednesday and Thursdays, like you and I together at the news desk. And we said, no more frowny face <laughs> for Yuya Watanabe because in Cube, he had drafted Phyrexian Obliterator, which costs black and black and black and black, which is perfectly fine. That means you're in a mono black deck, right? Of course. Yes, it does, except you're playing black blue. Mm. And that was the frowny face uh, for Watanabe. And he had good cause. He didn't do particularly well in Q, but he fought back, um, was in reasonable shape overnight, uh, and then really delivered uh, down the stretch. We said no more frowny face, uh, and he was in the bottom pod, and he won all three. And that's what set him up um, for his run down the modern stretch. So you took Yasuoka before the day started, perfectly reasonably. And certainly uh, in the semi final, that seemed not just a reasonable plan, but an absurdly obvious one, and well done you. 
here he is, 2-1 down. How does he feel now? How do you feel about his chances now? Or is that Olivia going to, in a way, steal, and no pun intended, because that's what she does, she steals vampires, to steal the Players' Championship for that man on the right, Yuji Watanabe? What do you think? Well, I'm certainly not a fan of admitting that I am wrong, uh, so uh, I don't really want to do that. Okay, so clearly <laughs> Asoka's still going to win. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, obvious. Done. Uh, conversation's over. No, I mean, I, certainly I, I think Watanabe is favored right here. He's got to be. He's up 2-1. There's enough variance in magic, enough comparable skill level between these two players, enough comparable power of the decks that, like, you just have to go with the match win percent, or uh, the match wins, or the yeah. game wins. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that said, I mean, I think uh, we saw him make some very fine-tuned adjustments to his deck for this game. I think he knows a little bit more about Watanabe's plan. Uh, so, I, you know what? I'm going to stick to my guns yep. and uh, say that uh, Yasuoka is still going to take this one down. All right. Well, we're about to find out. The players are looking at their opening hands. It looks like uh, Watanabe is going to mulligan uh, down to six, so a little bit of help uh, there for Yasuoka. Uh, Zach, you spent a lot of time uh, in the booth watching matches, something I haven't done uh, thus far this weekend. So I wanted to ask you your perception from these chairs um, of what you've seen, um, and in particular, anyone, clearly Yasuoka is a great story, um, but anyone else who you've been really kind of impressed by over the last two or three days? Sure. I mean, I actually have to give a shout out to Alexander Haint. Okay, I think that's uh, a great choice. He, he came to this tournament with a lot less experience than many of the other players. Hadn't really played on this stage before. You know, he's a young guy in general. W has, you know, a lot of momentum coming out of Pro Tour Avacyn Restored, but I think a lot of players didn't really know exactly what they were looking at with, with him. But he started out 4-0, commanding mm -hmm. performance in Cube Draft, which is a very skill-intensive format with a lot of interactions. You know, I ended up losing several in a row to kind of drift down back toward yeah. the middle of the pack. But remember, you know, it was like this when we looked at those win percentages. 50% against the best players in the world means that you're one of the best players in the world. So shout out to Alexander Hain. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think I think the big thing with Hain is that, uh, yes, sure, he started off great at 4-0. Sure, he lost a bunch. But at the point he lost a bunch, he then went, pro points are still on the line, and at six and six, I talked to him, and he said, I'm actually really happy. Six and six. And it's not even that he's back safely in the middle of the pack, because the way it worked out, partly because uh, of Shota at one end, just the, the way the sort of top and bottom exploded in a sense, you had 12 players between the force players at seven and five, a bunch on six and six, a bunch on five and seven. So yes, technically six, six was the middle of the pack. But I said to him, look, you finished one win away from the greatest player of all time in John Finkel against this incredible field. Um, and given how many Pro Tours you've played so far, given that hundreds and hundreds of your matches have been at the FNM level, the PTQ level, the local store level, to have done everything you've done here is just great. Let's get to the action. It's time for game four. Watanabe has mulligan to five, so let's get down to it. Uh, they are underway. I'm sorry you're still looking at me, uh, but I can see uh, what's going on. There we are. Uh, so it's just one land. You've not missed any substantive plays. Uh, Yasuoka uh, is now faced with a tapped land coming into play from Yuya Watanabe. So it is turn one. Both players still at 20. Turn two from Yasuoka. It's land and pass, and now Yasuoka's deck has to perform in the face, initially, of an Inquisition of Kozumak. All right, yeah, we see that Inquisition. Uh, Yasuoka has Mana Leak open. Looks like he, he's putting Greeting Pool into play untapped. Apparently needs a second green, signaling that he has Eternal Witness or multiple green spells in his hand. Otherwise, why not get an island? Very quickly now, he goes to Mana Leak. That spell has some spells he wants to protect, it looks like, in this matchup see a treetop village out of Watanabe's side. And uh, you have to think that uh, Yasuoka just wants to trade one for one against this mulligan. <laughs> yep. So uh, here's Eternal Witness. I'm going to get land back um, just to accelerate my mana, get myself up as uh, high as I can, as quickly as I can. And he's got double Tarmogoyf in hand. We can see a Maelstrom Pulse, Dark Confident, 
Tama Boy uh, sitting for Watanabe, and he is going to run out a Dark Confident. Uh, and uh, obviously it can't be Lightning Bolted just yet, uh, something uh, Yasuoka was very happy to do previously. He's drawn an Ether Vial here this turn. He attacks with his Eternal Witness. To nobody's surprise, the Dark Confident didn't block, forcing uh, Yasuoka to indeed use the Lightning Bolt he had to get rid of that card advantage machine that is Dark Confident. Right, and where I think we're about to see from Yasuo. Okay, Ether Vial into Tarmogoyf, really getting the beat down on, you know. the I, I really like the Eternal Witness for the Sackland, you know. Eternal Witness playing a, a poor man's Civic Wayfinder, a poor man's <laughs> Borderland Ranger. Not what you usually see out of that card, but that's one of the reasons it can be so powerful. It draws you out of the landlight draw, and really Tarmogoyf, Eternal Witness, Ether Vial with Cryptic Command in hand for Yasuoka. Pretty commanding position as Maelstrom Pulse hits Tarmogoyf. Yeah, that does that does change the the pace clearly. First counter though goes uh, on Ether Vile. There's a, another Tarmogoyf in hand for Yasuoka. Two points, and this has been far and away the fastest game uh, of the four. The pace of them uh, has uh, been pretty brisk. Uh, Terminator's gone into hand for Watanabe. I can tell you, as he uh, shuffles his four mana around. So he's got Terminate Tarmogoyf and Blood Crypt, so three cards in hand uh, for Watanabe right now. And we see the untapped Blood Crypt leading into, uh, I believe this is going to be a Tarmogoyf. Three mana up mm. for uh, Watanabe to attack with Treetop sure. Village if he so desires. Sure. So it's being offered up for a potential Cryptic Command, and, and Yasuoka is certainly representing that precise plan. Uh, but whether that will actually occur now, yeah, looks like it's going to. Hold on the box. And uh, bouncing the eternal witness again, setting up a loop. Oh, okay. Uh, but the response is terminates. Uh, yep. So uh, now Watanabe pretty much blank. He's got a treetop village in play. Ether Vial is at two. Yasuoka is going to lay a land. And it's going to be untapped. So now this is big because here's Glenelendra Archmage. He has the blue mana available to counter a non-creature spell. And of course it will then come back with Persist. So that's the next two meaningful non-creature spells from Watanabe will get done. And now, hey, here's a treetop village. Hey, guess what? Here's my Aether Vial yeah. for Tarmogoy. Bang, bang, bang. Yasuoka, back in business, baby. And absolutely a blowout. Tarmogoyf off that ether vial. The last card in Yasuoka's hand comes down, ambushes the village. No more gas left over in Yasuoka's hand after that, but Archmage Tarmogoyf on the board. Archmage can counter the next. Any two non-creature spells. We see a Liliana <laughs> from uh, Watanabe. Not really going to do a whole lot here. Watanabe at eight facing down. So it's very soon going to be a lethal attack. Yep, he says, uh, let's... Well, Obviously, I just functionally make you get rid of one of your two free counter spells. Um, and now, oh, beating. We said Yasuoka was back to the wall and he had to deliver. Has his deck ever delivered in game four? We're going to go the distance, I think, Zach Hill. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, his deck is delivering, offering up exactly what it needs. Watanabe mulliganing to five, obviously, uh, it really hurts when you're in a matchup, matchup as resource intensive as this one. A lot of lands on Yasuoka's side, but uh, it really just uh, kind of a commanding lead. Not really a lot you can do about Tarmogoyf with Glendalender Archmage on the table. Now, we do see a Jun Charm and a Dark Confidant, so uh, yeah, no. he could theoretically chump block, but it looks <laughs> like we're going to game five. All done. Blistering magic there between these two Japanese players. It is two games all. We have absolutely delivered the best of the best, and the best is yet to come because it will be a one-game shootout for the Players' Championship 2012. You see the trophy there in the center of your screen. One of these two players in the next five, ten, 15 minutes will lift that trophy. They will be the first Players' Championship winner. They will be the 2011-2012 Player of the Year. Let's look at the 16 who these two have battled through to get here to this stage. Let's take a look at the 16 one last time for this astonishing field. There you see it. Reed Duke, Su Ching Kuo. At the five sevens, you've got a Choa, Utter Layton, and Louis Scott Vargas. Who can imagine him with a negative record? 
at six and six. Half the field seemingly. Ian Arger, a world champion. Turtonwald, no one's had more GPs, top eights in one year than him. Martin Muser, the Czech master. Alexander Hain, the miracle man. Samuel Estrati, the king of modern. Brian Kibler was six and six. That's ridiculous that Kibler should only be six and six. But everyone should have had a positive record, but only a few of them could. Shuhei Nakamura, commiserations to him. The seven and five that didn't make it in to the final four here on Friday. And then John Finkel missing out in the semifinals behind Yasuoka. Paola Vita Damodarosa missing out in the semifinals against Yuya Watanabe. And now it is just the two Japanese giants remaining. Yasuoka 11 and 1, 12 and 1 now on the weekend, trying to make it 13 and 1. But if Watanabe wins this and goes to a notional 9 and 5, he will not care about five losses. What he will care about is the ninth win that would make him the first ever Players' Champion. And just to put these numbers in perspective, you see almost the entire field, 13 out of 16 players within two wins of each other. It's not because they're in a coin flipping contest. It's because they're all that good, clustered around that same power level, highly prepared. And so for Yasa Oka to just run away from the field at 11 and one is just a testament to his command of the game right now and his command of the formats of this event. Truly one of the most impressive feats I've seen in, you know, year, uh, over a decade of yeah. playing on the Pro Tour. And, and, uh, and I think something you said that really struck home was that all the players who attempted to play test the semifinal matchup, they didn't know his lines of play. They didn't know what his boarding strategy was going to be. They didn't know what his plan therefore post board was going to be. Nobody could get in the head of Shoti Asoka. But right now, you can bet that Yuya Watanabe is in Shoti Asoka's head because these great friends from Japan, they travel the world together. Obviously, there is a tight knit Japanese community. But now, these sideboard choices really, really matter. There's no chat, there's no smiling right now. It is deathly silent out there in the arena. Uh, also, another great testament uh, to this tournament is the fact that pretty much all of the other 14 are in the building watching this live. They could be at PAX. They could be somewhere else in Seattle. They could have gone, ah, I'm done. I'm going home. Nope. They're here, and they're watching, and they're watching history being made between these two. And I think the Players' Championship, really an appropriate title for an event like this. I mean, this is being done, obviously, for everybody watching at home to showcase Magic, but this is an event for the players, you know, recognizing the achievement of being one of the 16 best in the world. And I think the, the sense of community we've seen from the players over the course of this weekend has been really telling. You've heard it in the interviews. I've seen it walking around. You know, there's a lot of mutual respect filling this room right now mm. and a lot of investment in the outcome of this tournament. Talking of investment, you might need an investment broker after this because one of these two is going to win 40,000 US dollars. The loser of this next game still gets 20,000. But just think about it. If you've not played high stakes magic before, if you've not sat down when it's really, really mattered to you. And of course, the truth is, for a lot of us, that means round two of FNM at 0 and 1. But as you see Yuya Watanabe there, he's five, 10, 15 minutes away from 20,000 extra US dollars. That buys a lot of Pez dispensers. <laughs> buys a lot of things rich I mean and that's something that gets lost so much as we talk about pro points and pro club levels and matchups and win percentages they're not just in this for the glory they're not just in this for the love of the game a lot of money is on the line here at the players championship forty thousand dollars is no small amount of change and I mean the, the pressure of having, you know, one opening hands of seven cards determining $20,000 being on the line. Uh, there aren't very many things uh, comparable to that in life. Not very many uh, matches or, or really 15-minute intervals you can no. think of when that you are get this high stakes. Yeah, where you get put on the line in that way. Because there is going to be a point in this game, almost certainly, where one of these two, maybe both, but certainly one of them, will have a choice to make. And it'll be a choice with a capital C, where you can't do two things, you can only do one, 
and the right one leads you to be a champion and the wrong one leads you to a runner-up berth and people remembering who did that guy beat in the final <laughs> the players are drawing their opening hands for the final time let's see no mulligans please not just because we want to see magic but because we want a great final game they are both going to keep it's time for the final game of the final match of the first players championship 2012 we begin with yuya watanabe on the right he is playing jund jund and he is up against shota yasuoka with eternal command he blisters out his beloved ether vial the signature card of the weekend zach hill you're still with Yasuoka, right? I've got to respect the turn one Aether Vow, but what that does mean is that it's not a turn one spell snare, meaning that the Tarmogoyf and Dark Confidant in the Jun deck are looking very, very good right now. Uh, we see a lot of lands in Watanabe's hand. He really wishes, I'm sure, that he had more live spells than that, but that can get him up to Blood Braid Elf to get in the driver's seat. On the other hand, Yasuoka leading with Aether Vile. That represents a ton of mana this game. I feel like both players have reasonably good starts right here. Looks to me like the problem with either Dark Confident or Tarmogoyf is we know that Yasuoka has a Lightning Bolt in hand. So in a sense, and Watanabe must expect that there'll be something to deal with threat number one. So it's really a case of, can I run something out that I'm happy to have dealt with? Or am I actually going to have to give something I don't want to give up, up? We'll see. He is really, you see, this is, this is what I mean, Zach. The number of times you and Watanabe would debate internally three or four times about this second land, nope, that doesn't happen in playtesting. But right here, that's $20,000 worth of turn two land, maybe. So, so much on the line. And we see the Dark Confidant is the choice, getting up a forest to avoid taking extra damage. Yasuoka does have the Lightning Bolt. We expect that he is going to use it. But both Tarmogoyf and Kitchen Finks from Watanabe, meaning that Lightning Bolt does not stop the pressure. It only starts it off. So uh, we are going to see him draw a card right here. Uh, and he's got the, the Lightning Bolt. He <laughs> cast it before even really looking at his yeah. next card. I don't care about the land. Let's just get that thing gone. I get Hive seeing it out confident in this play. Go away. <laughs> Ether Violet 1. We go back to Yuya Watanabe. Our congratulations to the other 14 and now these two last remaining battles. Uh, Yasuoka representing Spell Snare right now for that Tarmogoyf. I have to expect Kitchen Finks is going to be the play here for that reason. Uh, also does not want to run into Threads of Disloyalty, but again, mm. a lot of options for Watanabe. And you cannot just impulsively cast a spell here with this much on the line. So, he looks, and, you know, it, do, it does seem to me like maybe Watanabe is, is thinking himself. I, I don't want to say that he's overthinking things, because I don't know what's in his head. But he's certainly exhibiting some body language of a lot of uh, tentativeness, a lot of being uh, just double-checking and triple-checking and quadruple-checking everything he's doing. And he is going to say, here's Tarmogoyf. All right, so Tarmogoyf comes down instead of Kitchen Finks. That Tarmogoyf creature mm -hmm. land instant in the graveyard. So it is a 3-4 for mm -hmm. two mana. And now there's a treetop village as well for Watanabe. So right now, he could mount a substantial offense. 3-3 three, three, treetop village, 3-4 three, Tarmogoyf. Yasuoka at 19, and there's every chance that Yasuoka will take some incidental land damage somewhere here. So it may very well be a three-turn clock right now sitting on the board. Now, it's unlikely that that is how the game is going to play out, uh, but it does just give you a guide to how far advanced the game is even at this early stage, apparently. Ether Vile ticks to two for Yasuoka. He looks, he draws. Oh, that'll be a spell snare for the Tarmogoyf you just played. Thanks, deck. Yeah, one turn too late on that spell snare, but the Aether Violet 2 threatening a Tarmogoyf in combat. We see Eternal Witness, we see Thirst for Knowledge, we see Vendillion Click. One of those is definitely going to get cast. The question is, which one? Mm. Well, we're going to find out as Watanabe draws. Looks like he drew Inquisition of Kozilek. He did indeed. Uh, so now he looks. He's got a Blood Braid Elf in hand. He's got a Kitchen Finx in hand, as we know. And now five cards total. 
sitting there. You, know, you almost have to think Yasuo uh, Oka is going to prioritize the Thirst for Knowledge right now. His deck very dependent upon tapping out on turn four at least four mana creatures after sideboard with both Glenelindra, Archmage, and Huntmaster of the Fells. Without any of those in his hand, he does not have any good answers to Blood Raid Elf right now. Well, I don't know I'll be forced to 17, and this is the opening, uh, opening act of a little bit of ballet here, which is I would like to offer you this Inquisition of Kozilek, because I would quite like to find what those five cards are. And then there is a little subplot of this land going away, which is going to turn into something different. Um, so that's sort of part two of this little dance that's going to go on here. Um, and then Shabby Asuka, we think, um, may well decide that a bit of uh, getting a bit thirsty for some knowledge. I mean, the perfect information, well, and I think actually what we might see is Vendillion click into Tarmogoyf to set up a board presence okay. right here. Uh, it is hard to say what we'll have to see, but uh, something that's so interesting about this matchup is there's so many specific interactions between cards. We do see Vendillion click now that uh, it's worth it to Watanabe to not cast Blood Raid Elf right here mm -hmm. just to have information from that Inquisition. Okay, Kitchen Finks goes away. Uh, now we see um, as uh, Shota swaps them around, Thirst for Knowledge, Spell Snare, and Eternal Witness, and a Misty Rainbow. So that's the perfect information there. Uh, Yasuoka doesn't have quite perfect information the other way. He knows two of the cards, um, and he's just sent Kitchen Finks away. Um, and we don't know yet what Wadanabe has, but we see, in fact, it is Terminate uh, that has come into hand in place um, via that Vendillion click from Yasuoka. Now we see uh, Yasuoka taking Kitchen Finks off that click. Very smart. Strands Watanabe's three mana right now. He could activate Treetop Village and attack. He knows the coast is clear from the Ether Vials, so uh, that's certainly an option of his. I don't know if you block if you're Yasuoka right here. In comes the Tamagoyf. It turns out to be a mute, a mute point. The uh, Treetop Village does not, in fact, attack. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, Yasuoka can thirst for knowledge here before deciding whether or not to put a counter on Ether Vial, getting more information about what he's going to draw. Just sure. it, though, doesn't commit to tapping that mana that soon, leaves Ether Vial at two counters. All right. He drew. He sacrifices Misty Rainforest. There's a Glenelendra Archmage getting uh, into hand as we see the Misty Rainforest turn into Island. So Yasuoka up to four mana. Remember that treetop village. We've seen that those creature lands be critical, and it could be that a few life points either way could make all the difference here. So just keep an eye on that one uh, as we see this game develop. Uh, Yasuoka very quickly now getting an island. We have to expect that's for the Archmage. Unfortunately, uh, Archmage right now, no mana up to protect it. Mm. So, uh, you know, the Blood Raid Elf looking to come down and uh, do a lot of damage on this attack. Yasuoka does not attack with Vendillion Click, <laughs> needing to leave it back as a blocker, sure. understanding the damage potential represented by that Bloodbraid Elf. Absolutely. It was a land drawn uh, for Watanabe. He has Terminate, Bloodbraid Elf. We're going to see the Bloodbraid <coughs> any moment, we think. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Another option maybe is Terminate yep. plus Treetop Attack, oh. but no, we're going to see Blood, Blood Raid. Elf it cascades into, into land, 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 Liliana of the Vale. Yep. Okay. Liliana kind of, uh, c you know, certainly not bad here, but a little bit awkward with the Persist off the Glenelindra Archmage. Sure. The comparatively bad spell snare we know in Yasaoka's hand. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not really sure if uh, Liliana's going to tick up or down right now or just kind of not do a whole lot just Yeah, yet. that was kind of all right for Yasaoka, wasn't it, as, uh, as Bloodbraid Cascades go? Right. In as much as Bloodbraid Elf Cascading into a three-mana spell is ever okay for you. <laughs> We see Glenelendra block Bloodbraid Elf coming back with one persist counter. Okay. So Yasuoka is down to just nine. He's into single figures now. And now we really are at a world where missteps will be very costly. We see that uh, the point goes away. So it's just a Glenelendra Ar Archmage. Ether Violet 2. Two cards in hand for Yasuoka. And tick up the Ether Vial to three. Yasuoka draws. He's drawn a lightning bolt. He is going to attack Liliana to dead and then pass the turn. Watanabe is nine points away from being 
the Players' Championship winner for 2012 and the 2011-2012 Player of the Year. Nine life points. There's a treetop village there. Remember, it's still there. Tarmogoyf currently is a 4-5. Ether Violet 3. He activates Treetop Village. He sends in the team. Now it's time to see what Yasuoka can do. He's going to cast Thirst for Knowledge. Uh, what an RB scratches his head and then says, sure. Three cards head towards Yasuoka. It looks like there's a second lightning bolt there. He's got Tarmogoy, Spell Snare. He's going to get rid of that and an island. He has pretty exciting uh, cards here. He's got lightning bolt, Tarmogoy, lightning bolt. That's okay. his hand right now. The treetop village bites the dust, but Tarmogoy piles in. And now Shota is down to four. Here's, is this going to be Terminate? No, it's Dark Confident. Now, Shouty Asoka, last chance saloon. You're down to four. It's getting really, really tight here at the Players' Championship. Now, what he doesn't know, he, he got rid of Spell Snare with Tarmogoyf in his hand in favor of Lightning Bolt. Bolt capable of taking out that Confidant, but uh, Terminate from Watanabe, devastating potentially right now, gets rid of at the very least the Archmage. Yasaoka slams down the Serum Visions, looking for an answer right here, but uh, he does have enough to stay alive at the very least mm. for the immediate future. Yeah, he's going to put one on the top, one on the bottom. He likes something that he sees. Ether Violet 3, he gets to counter something with Glenelendra Archmage. He's got Lightning Bolt and a land and a Tarmogoyf. Snapcaster Mage, we can tell you, is what's on top of Yasuoka's library. Now, a big decision here about oh. whether to put Stomping Grounds into play, tapped or untapped. Untapped lets him play Tarmogoyf, keep blue up for Archmage, red up for Lightning Bolt, but drops him down to two precarious life points. Big decision right here for yep. Yasuoka. And here you have it. This is it right here, right now. It's a question about a land that doesn't even cast anything. It's just, is this about to hit myself in the head for two, or is it going to sit there? That's, oh, what do you do, Shota? And, we, and he looks, oh, yeah. is this, is he going to be in lightning bolt me. range? It's going to go down one way or the other. We told you it would come down to a choice. The choice is I'm at two. Now I'm going to tap it and lightning bolt the Dark Confident. I'm going to run out Tarmogoyf. I have my island for Glenelendra Archmage. Epic magic here at the Players' Championship. Oh, boy. Wow. Is a that blood a blood raid? raid? Elf off the top with Yasuoka at two life. Exactly the card Watanabe There's needed blood to draw here. from Watanabe. What does he cascade into? It's Maelstrom Pulse. He says, I will Maelstrom Pulse the Glenelendra Archmage. Yeah, it doesn't want to target Tarmogoy because that blow up his own Tarmogoy. In they come, and that's, and that's it. Game. What a match. What a week. What a Narby. <laughs> that is your yeah. player's oh, champion yeah. for 2012. From the top, it was Cascade that did it. 2012, the Magic Players Championship goes to Yuya Watanabe. In 2009, he was the Player of the Year. And in 2012, he is the Player of the Year once again. That is absolutely amazing stuff. Zach Hill, what do you make of that final turn? I mean, I thought that uh, Yasuoka was going to stabilize. You know, he, he played it untapped. He had the answers for everything we knew about. Snapcaster Mage on top, looking to bring the game back within his control, but a devastating Blood Braid Elf takes the first ever Players' Championship for Yuya Watanabe. That is just staggering magic. Watanabe, we said when he was way back in the field, he had to make a run on day two. He did, and then all the way, the 2012 Magic the Gathering Players' Championship winner is Yuya Watanabe, and he is the 2011-2012 Player of the Gentlemen, Year. the winner of the inaugural Players' Championship, the 2011-2012 Player of the Year from Japan, Yuya Watanabe. Once again, everybody, the 2012 Player of the Year, Yuya Watanabe. Well, goodness gracious me, Yasuoka all the way to the brink of the finish line.
But when it counted, what was the mechanic that did it? It was Cascade Time with Bloodbraid Elf into Maelstrom Pulse. And we said, there's this stomping ground. I'm at four. This way. That way. This way. That way. This way. I'm at two. Just, just, just uh, uh, amazing, those decisions. And, and then whatever your decision... <laughs> Here's a Bloodbraid Elf. I'm going to cast it. Right. There's a Maelstrom Pulse. That's the Archmage. <laughs> in with my Tarmog Gods. In with my Bloodbraid Elf. I am the champion. And there's got to be no better rush in Magic than that. And Yu Yu Watanabe, he is not a demonstrative guy. But that huge roar of triumph that, that we're seeing. We're seeing him taking uh, trophy shots uh, off screen. And uh, uh, I'm so pleased for him because we said to him uh, this morning in the semifinals, before they started, we said, look, if you win this, you've won six Grand Prix, you've multiple national teams. It's got to be the biggest result for you uh, of your Magic career. And he said, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Players' Championship here, you're against the best of the best. There's no field of 1,800 people. There are no buys. You have to beat the best players on Earth to win this title. And that is exactly what Watanabe has done. The match, the week, Watanabe does the business. Thanks for being with us on Friday. We're going to send you back to the booth. It's time to say goodbye from us and it's over to Marshall Sutcliffe and Sheldon Mennery. All right, welcome back to the news desk. My name is Marshall Sutcliffe. This is Sheldon Mennery. Whoa! Bloodbraid Elf wins the Magic You were so excited. I was, I was dancing in the aisles. He saw Bloodbraid Elf coming. <laughs> Bloodbraid Elf, yeah, that's going to do it. It was awesome. It was, that, that was such, a, you and I were both hunched over. We've got a <laughs> monitor here, and we were just gripped, staring at the screen the whole time. Yeah, that, I mean, that got really tight. We talked we talked at the top of the this match. If there was a deck that was going to be able to yeah. beat uh, Shota's Brew, it was this Jun deck. And it, yeah, I mean, it went five really, really grindy games, yeah. and he he ended up getting it done. I mean, Shota looked like he was in good position on that last turn to at least be alive, but mm -hmm. Bloodbraid Elf had something else to say about yeah, it. He sure did. Yeah, and you know, that's I think that's a, a one of the big pluses to Jun. I think it's a, one of the big reasons why you might bring a deck like Jun to this uh, field is that you know what, it can just beat anything on any mm -hmm. given day. Yeah, oh, well, that's why. I mean, I loved it when we, it was in standard and. If I was playing modern right now, I'd be I'd be out there running it. This guy. BBE. I know somebody else who loves it. Yuya Watanabe. <laughs> so big right. congrats to Yuya for the player of the year. Yeah. He wins the title, he wins the money, and for the whole rest of the year he's gonna be the player of the year. His second one. Yep. So first since two thousand three when uh, Kai repeated. Yeah, so another uh, exclamation point yeah. on his stellar resume. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Had a great time this weekend. Watched great magic yep. uh, through these all these these 15 rounds cube of, draft m13 draft modern i mean it was like heaven for me yeah it's just that there were all exciting formats we all we got to see play elite players play elite magic and what more could you want from three days of the players championship that's right okay so for everybody here on the coverage team from seattle washington sheldon menery marshall cycliffe for zach hill we've got What's that guy's name? Richard Hagen. You might know him. Everybody here on the coverage team, thank you for watching, and we'll see you soon. Magic Celebration, September 8, 2012. Playing a no-charge mini master event while supplies last. Compliments of Wizards of the Coast. Find a location near you at locator.wizards.com.